Section 37 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of Three Worthies, Part 3. The Story of Sir Gawain, Chapter 1st, Part 1. Part 3. The Story of Sir Gawain. Here followeth the story of Sir Gawain, and of how he discovered such wonderful faithfulness unto King Arthur, who was his lord, that I do not believe that the like of such faithfulness was ever seen before. For indeed, though Sir Gawain was at times very rough and harsh in his manner, and though he was always so plain-spoken that his words hid the gentle nature that lay within him, yet under this pride of manner was much courtesy and at times he was so urbane of manner and so soft of speech that he was called by many the knight of the silver tongue so here ye shall read how his faithfulness unto king arthur brought him such high reward that almost any one in all the world might envy him his great good fortune chapter first how a white heart appeared before king arthur and how sir gawain and gaheris his brother went in pursuit thereof, and of what befell them in that quest. Upon a certain time, King Arthur, together with Queen Guinevere and all of his court, were making progression through that part of his kingdom, which was not very near to Camelot. At this time the king journeyed in very great state, and Queen of Guinevere had her court about her. So there were many esquires and pages, wherefore what with knights, lords, and ladies in attendance, more than six score of people were with the king and queen. Now it chanced that at this time the season of the year was very warm, so that when the middle of the day had come the king commanded that a number of pavilions should be spread for their accommodation, wherein that they might rest there until the heat of the day had passed. So the attendants spread three pavilions in a pleasant glade upon the outskirts of the forest. When this had been done, the king gave command that the tables, whereat they were to eat their midday meal, should be spread beneath the shadow of that glade of trees, for there was a gentle wind blowing, and there were many birds singing, so that it was very pleasant to sit in the open air. Accordingly, the attendants of the court did as the king commanded, and the tables were set upon the grass beneath the shade, and the king and queen and all the lords and ladies of their courts sat down to that cheerful repast. Now whiles they sat there feasting with great content of spirit, and with much mirth and goodly talk among themselves, there came of a sudden a great outcry from the woodland that was near by, and therewith there burst forth from the cover of that leafy wilderness a very beautiful white heart, pursued by a white brachet of equal beauty. And there was not a hair upon either of these animals that was not as white as milk, and each wore about its neck a collar of gold, very beautiful to behold. The hound pursued the white hart with a very great outcry and bellowing, and the hart fled in the utmost terror. In this wise they ran thrice around the table where King Arthur and his court sat at meat, and twice in that chase the hound caught the hart and pinched it on its haunch, and therewith the hart leapt away, and all they who sat there observed that there was blood at two places upon its haunch where the hound had pinched it but each time the hart escaped from the hound, and the hound followed after it with much outcry of yelling, so that King Arthur and Queen Guinevere and all their court were annoyed at the noise and tumult that those two creatures made. Then the hart fled away into the forest again by another path, and the hound pursued it, and both were gone, and the baying of the hound sounded more and more distant as it ran away into the woodland. Now, ere the king and queen and their court had recovered from their astonishment at these things, there suddenly appeared at that part of the forest whence the hart and the hound had emerged, a knight and a lady, and the knight was a very lordly presence, and the lady was exceedingly beautiful. The knight was clad in half-armour, and the lady was clad in green, as though for the chase, and the knight rode upon a charger of dapple grey, and the lady upon a piebald palfrey. With them were two esquires, also clad for the chase. These, seeing the considerable company gathered there, paused as though in surprise, and whilst they stood so, there suddenly appeared another knight upon a black horse, 
clad in complete armor, and he seemed to be very angry, for he ran upon the half-armed knight and smote him so sorry a blow with his sword that the first knight fell down from his horse and lay upon the ground as though dead, whereat the lady who was with him shrieked with great dolor. Then the full-armed knight upon the black horse ran to the lady and catched her, and he lifted her from her palfrey and laid her across the horn of his saddle, and thereupon he rode back into the forest again. The lady screamed with such vehemence of violent outcry that it was a great pity to hear her, but the knight paid no attention to her shrieking, but bore her away by main force into the forest. Then, after he and the lady had gone, the two esquires came, and lifted up the wounded knight upon his horse, and then they also went away into the forest, and were gone. All this King Arthur and his court beheld from a distance, and they were so far away that they could not stay that knight upon the black horse from doing what he did to carry away the lady into the forest nor could they bring succour to that other knight in half-armour whom they had beheld struck down in that wise. So they were very greatly grieved at what they had beheld, and knew not what to think of it. Then King Arthur said to his court, Messiahs, is there not some one of you who will follow up this adventure, and discover what is the significance of that which we have seen, and compel that knight to tell why he behaved as he did? Upon this Sir Gawain said, Lord, I shall be very glad indeed to take upon me this adventure, if I have thy leave to do so. And King Arthur said, Thou hast my leave. Then Sir Gawain said, Lord, I would that thou would also let me take my younger brother, Gaheris, with me, as mine esquire in this undertaking. For he groweth apace unto manhood, and yet he hath never beheld any considerable adventure at arms. So King Arthur said, Thou hast my leave to take thy brother with thee. At this Gaheris was very glad, for he was of an adventurous spirit, wherefore the thought of going with his brother upon this quest gave him great pleasure. So they too went to the pavilion of Sir Gawain, and there Geheris aided Sir Gawain as his esquire to don his armor. Then they rode forth upon that quest which Sir Gawain had undertaken. Now they journeyed onward for a very considerable distance, following that direction which they had seen the hart take when it had sped away from before the hound, and when, from time to time, they would meet some of the forest folk, they would inquire of them whither had fled that white brachet and the white heart, and whither had fled the knight and the lady, and so they followed that adventure apace. By and by, after a long pass, it being far advanced in the afternoon, they were suddenly aware of a great uproar of conflict, as of a fierce battle in progress. So they followed this sound, and after a while they came to an open meadowland, with very fair and level sward. Here they beheld two knights fighting with great vehemence of passion and with a very deadly purpose. Then Sir Gawain said, What is this? Let us go see. So he and Geheris rode forward to where those two knights were engaged, and as they approached the two knights paused in their encounter and rested upon their weapons. Then Sir Gawain said, Ha, Messiahs, what is to do, and why do ye fight with such passion, the one against the other in that wise? Then one of the knights said to Sir Gawain, Sir, this does not concern you. And the other said, Meddle not with us, for this battle is of our own choosing. Messiahs, said Sir Gawain, I would be very sorry to interfere in your quarrel, but I am in pursuit of a white heart and a white brachet that came this way, and also of a knight who hath carried off a lady upon the same pass. Now I would be greatly beholden to ye, if you would tell me if ye have seen aught of one or the other. Then that knight who had first spoken said, Sir, this is a very strange matter for it was upon account of that very white heart and that brachet, and of the knight and the lady that we two were just now engaged in that battle as thou didst behold. For the case is this. We two are two brothers, and we were riding together in great amity when that heart and that hound came hitherward. Then my brother said he very greatly hoped that the white heart would escape from the hound, and I said that I hoped the hound would overtake the heart and bring it to earth. Then came that knight with that lady, his captive, and I said that I would follow that knight and rescue the lady, and my brother said that he would undertake that adventure. Upon these points we fell into dispute, for it appeared to me that I felt a great affection for that hound, and my brother felt as extraordinary regard for the white heart, and that, as I had first spoken, I should have the right to follow that adventure. But my brother felt affection for the heart, and he considered that as he was the elder of us twain, he had the best right to the adventure. So we quarrelled, and by and by we fell to upon that fight, 
in which thou didst see us engaged. At this Sir Gawain was very greatly astonished, and he said, Messires, I cannot understand how so great a quarrel should have arisen from so small a dispute, and certes it is a great pity for two brothers to quarrel as ye have done, and to give one another such sore cuts and wounds as I perceive you have both received. Messires, said the second knight, I think thou art right, and I now find myself to be very much ashamed of that quarrel. And the other said, I too am sorry for what I have done. Then Sir Gawain said, Sirs, I would be very glad indeed, if you would tell me your names. And the one knight said, I am called Sir Sorlois of the forest. And the other said, I am called Sir Brian of the forest. Then Sir Sorlois said, Sir Knight, I would deem it a very great courtesy, if thou wouldst tell me who thou art. I would be very glad to do that, said Sir Gawain. And therewith he told them his name and condition. Now when they heard who Sir Gawain was, those two knights were very greatly astonished and pleased, for no one in all the courts of chivalry was more famous than Sir Gawain, the son of King Lot of Orkney. Wherefore those two brothers said, It is certainly a great joy to us to meet so famous a knight as thou art, Sir Gawain. Then Sir Gawain said, Sir knights, that hart and that hound came only a short while ago to where King Arthur and Queen Guinevere and their courts of lords and ladies were at feast, and there likewise all we beheld that knight seize upon the lady and make her captive. Wherefore I and my brother have come forth upon command of King Arthur, for to discover what is the meaning of that which we beheld. Now I shall deem it a very great courtesy upon your part, if you will cease from this adventure, and will go in amity unto the court of the king, and will tell him of what ye beheld, and of how you quarrelled, and of how we met. For otherwise I myself will have to engage ye both, and that would be a great pity, for ye are weary with battle, and I am fresh. Then these two knights said, Sir, we will do as you desire, for we have no wish to have to do with so powerful a knight as you. Thereupon those two knights departed, and went to the court of King Arthur as Sir Gawain ordained. And Sir Gawain and his brother rode forward upon their adventure. Now, by and by, they came nigh to a great river, and there they beheld before them a single knight in full armor, who carried a spear in his hand, and a shield hanging to his saddle-bow. Thereupon Sir Gawain made haste forward, and he called aloud to the knight, and the knight paused and waited until Sir Gawain had overtaken him. And when Sir Gawain came up to that knight, he said, Sir knight, hast thou seen a white hart and a white hound pass by this way? And hast thou seen a knight bearing off a captive lady? Unto this the knight said, Yea, I beheld them both, and I am even now following after them with intent to discover whither they are bound. Then Sir Gawain said, Sir knight, I bid thee not to follow this adventure farther, for I myself am set upon it. Wherefore I desire thee for to give it over, so that I may undertake it in thy stead. Sir, said the other knight, speaking with a very great deal of heat, I know not who thou art, nor do I care a very great deal. But touching the pursuance of this adventure, I do tell thee that I myself intend to follow it to the end, and so will I do. Let who will undertake to stay me. Thereupon Sir Gawain said, Messiah, thou shalt not go forward upon this adventure unless thou hast first to do with me. And the knight said, Sir, I am very willing for that. So each knight took such stand upon that field as appeared to him to be best, and each put himself into a posture of defence, and dressed his shield and his spear. Then when they were thus prepared in all ways, they immediately launched forth the one against the other, rushing together with great speed and with such an uproar that the ground trembled and shook beneath them. So they met together in the midst of the course, and the spear of the strange knight burst all into small pieces, but the spear of Sir Gawain held. Wherefore he hurled that knight out of his saddle with such violence that he smote the ground with a blow like an earthquake. Then Sir Gawain rode back to where his enemy was, for that knight was unable to arise. And he removed the helmet from the head of the fallen knight, and beheld that he was very young and comely. Now when the fresh air smote upon the knight's face, he presently awoke from his swoon, and came back unto his senses again. Whereupon Sir Gawain said, Dost thou yield unto me? And the knight said, I do so. Then Sir Gawain said, Who art thou? And the knight said, I am called Sir Allardin of the Isles. Very well, said Sir Gawain, then I lay my command upon thee in this wise. 
that thou shalt go to the court of King Arthur, and deliver thyself to him as a captive of my prowess. And thou art to tell him all that thou knowest of the hart, and the hound, and the knight, and the lady. And thou shalt tell him all that hath befallen thee in this assault. End of section 37《Section 38 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daphne Ma. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of Three Worthies, Part 3. The story of Sir Gawain, chapter first, part two. So the knight said that he would do that, and thereupon they parted, the one party going the one way, and the other party going the other way. After that Sir Gawain and his brother Gaheris rode a considerable distance, until they came by and by, through a woodland, into an open plain, and it was now about the time of sunset and they beheld in the midst of the plain a very stately and noble castle with five towers and of very great strength and right here they saw a sight that filled them with great sorrow for they beheld the dead body of that white brassette lying beside the road like any carrion and they saw that the hound was pierced through with three arrows wherefore they wist that it had been slain very violently now when sir gawain beheld that beautiful hound lying dead in that wise he was filled with great sorrow what a pity it is he cried that this noble hound should be slain in this wise for i think that it was the most beautiful hound that ever i saw in all my life here hath assuredly been great treachery against it for it hath been foully dealt with because of that white heart which it pursued now i make my vow that if i can find that heart i will slay it with mine own hands because it was in that chase that this hound met its death after that they rode forward toward the castle and as they drew nigh lo they beheld that white heart with the golden collar browsing upon the meadows before the castle now as soon as the white heart beheld those two strangers it fled with great speed toward the castle and it ran into the courtyard of the castle and when sir gawain beheld the stag he gave chase in pursuit of it with great speed and gaheris followed after his brother so sir gawain pursued the white heart into the courtyard of the castle and from thence it could not escape then Sir Gawain leaped him down from his horse, and drew his sword, and slew the heart with a single blow of his weapon. This he did in great haste, but when he had done that, and it was too late to mend it, he repented him of what he had done very sorely. Now, with all this tumult, there came out the lord and the lady of the castle, and the lord was one very haughty and noble aspect and the lady was extraordinarily graceful and very beautiful of appearance sir gawain looked upon the lady and he thought he had hardly ever seen so beautiful a dame wherefore he was more sorry than ever that in his haste he had slain that white heart but when the lady of the castle beheld the white heart that it lay dead upon the stone pavement of the courtyard she smote her hands together and shrieked with such shrillness and strength that it pierced the ears to hear her and she cried out o oh, my white heart art thou then dead and wherewith she fell to weeping with great passion and then sir gawain said lady i am very sorry for what i have done and i would that i could undo it then the lord of the castle said to sir gawain sir didst thou slay that stag yeah said sir gawain sir said the lord of the castle thou hast done very ill in this matter and if thou wilt wait a little i will take full vengeance upon thee unto which sir gawain said 
I will wait for thee as long as it shall please thee. Then the lord of the castle went into his chamber and clad himself in his armor, and in a little while he came out very fiercely. Sir, said Sir Gawain, what is thy quarrel with me? And the lord of the castle said, Because thou hast slain the white heart that was so dear to my lady. To the wit Sir Gawain said, I would not have slain the white heart, only that because of it the white brachette was so treacherously slain. Upon this the lord of the castle was more wroth than ever, and he ran at Sir Gawain and smote him unawares, so that he clave through the epaulier of his armour, and cut through the flesh, and unto the bone of the soldier, so that Sir Gawain was put to a great agony of pain at the stroke. Then Sir Gawain was filled with rage at the pain of the wound, wherefore he smote the knight so woeful a blow that he cut through his helmet and into the bone beneath, and thereupon the knight fell down upon his knees because of the fierceness of the blow, and he could not rise up again. Then Sir Gawain cast his helmet and rasped it off from his head. Upon this the knight said in a weak voice, Sir Knight, I crave mercy of you, and yield myself to you. But Sir Gawain was very furious with anger, because of the unexpected blow which he had received, and because of the great agony of the wound. Wherefore he could not have mercy, but lifted up his sword with intent to slay that knight. Then the lady of the castle beheld what Sir Gawain was intent to do, and she brake away from her damsels, and ran and flung herself upon the knight, so as to seal him with her own body. And in that moment Sir Gawain was striking, and could not stay his blow. Nevertheless he was able to turn his sword in his hand, so that the edge thereof did not smite the lady. But the flat of the sword struck her upon the neck a very grievous blow, and the blade cut her a little, so that the blood ran over her smooth white neck and over her kerchief. And with the violence of the blow the lady fell down, and lay upon the ground as though she were dead. Now when Sir Gawain beheld that, he thought that he had slain that lady in his haste, and he was all at red at what he had done, wherefore he cried, Woe is me! What have I done? Alas! said Gaheris, that was a very shameful blow that thou didst strike, and the same of it is mine also, because thou art my brother. Now I wish I had not come with thee to this place. Then Sir Gawain said to the lord of that castle, Sir, I will spare thy life, for I am very sorry for what I have done in my haste. But the knight of the castle was filled with great bitterness, because he thought that his lady was dead, wherefore he cried out as in despair, I will not now have thy mercy, for thou art a knight without mercy and without pity, and since thou hast slain my lady, who is dearer to me than my life, thou mayst slay me also, for that is the only service which thou canst now render me. But by now the damsels of the lady had come to her where she lay, and the chiefest of these cried out to the lord of the castle, ha sir thy lady is not dead but only in a swoon form which she will presently recover then when the lord of the castle heard that he fell to weeping in great measure from pure joy for now that he knew his lady was alive he could not contain himself for joy Therewith Sir Gawain came to him, and lifted him up from the ground where he was, and kissed him upon the cheek. Then certain others came and bare the lady away into her chamber, and there in a little while she recovered from that swoon, and was but little the worse for the blow she had received. That night Sir Gawain and his brother Gaheris abided with the knight and the lady, and when the knight learned who Sir Gawain was, he felt it great honour to have so famous a knight in that place. So they feasted together that evening in great amity. 
Now, after they had refreshed themselves, Sir Gawain said, I beseech you, sir, to tell me what was the meaning of the white heart and the white brassette which led me into this adventure. To this the lord of the castle, whose name was Sir Albemore of the Maurice, said, I will do so, and therewith he spake as follows. You must know, sir, that I have a brother, who hath always been very dear to me, and when I took this, my lady, unto wife, he took her sister as his wife. Now my brother dwelt in a castle nigh to this, and we held commerce together in great amity. But it befell upon a day that my lady and my brother's lady were riding through the forest together, discoursing very pleasantly. One time there appeared a lady unto them, exceedingly beautiful, and of very strange appearance, for I do not think that either my lady or her sister ever beheld her like before. This strange lady brought unto those two ladies a white heart and a white brassette, and the heart and the hounds he held each by a silver chain attached to a golden collar that encircled its neck and the white hearts he gave unto my lady and the white brassettes he gave unto my lady's sister and thence he went away leaving them very glad but their gladness did not last for very long for ever since that time there hath been nothing else but discord between my brother and myself and between my lady and her sister for the white hound hath ever sought the white heart for to destroy it wherefore i and my lady have entertained very great offence against my brother and his lady because they did not keep the white brassette at home so it has come to pass that a number of times we have sought to destroy the hound so that my brother and his lady have held equal offence against us now this day it chanced i was toward the outskirts of the forest to the east of us when i heard a grey outcry in the woodland and by and by the white heart that belonged to my lady came fleeing through the woodland and the white brassette that belonged to my brother's lady was in pursuit of it and my brother and his lady and two esquires followed rapidly after the hut and the brassette then i was very greatly angered for it seemed to me that they were chasing that white heart out of despite of my lady and myself wherefore i followed after them with all speed so i came upon them at the outskirts of the woodland nigh to where there were a number of pavilions pitched in the shade of a glade of trees in the midst of the meadow and there in my anger i struck my brother a great blow so that i smote him down from his horse and i cast his lady and i threw her across the horn of my saddle and i bore her away to this castle and here i have held her out of revenge because they pursued the white heart which belonged to my lady for my lady loved that heart as she loved nothing else in the world except in myself sir said sir gawain this is a very strange matter now i beseech thee to tell me of what appearance was the lady who gave the white heart and the white hound unto those two ladies messiah said the knight she was clad all in crimson and about her throat and arms were a great many ornaments of gold beset with stones of diverse colours and her hair was red like gold was a man in a net of gold and her eyes were very black and sown with exceeding brightness and her lips were like coral so that she possessed a very strange appearance ha said sir gawain from this description methinks the lady should have been none other than the sorceress vivienne for now she spendeth all her time in doing such mischief as this by means of her enchantment out of pure despite and indeed i think it would be a very good thing if she were put out of this world so that she could do no more such mischief but tell me messiah where now is that lady thy wife's sister sir said the knight she is in the castle and is a prisoner of honour well 
quoth Sir Gawain, since now both the hart and the hound are dead, ye can assuredly bear no more enmity toward her and your brother. Wherefore I do beseech you that you will let her go free, and will enter again into a condition of amity and good will the one with the other, in such a manner as hath afore obtained between you. And the lord of the castle said, Sir, it shall be so and so he set the lady free at the time and thereafter there was amity between them as sir gawain had ordained and the next day sir gawain and his brother gaheris returned unto this court of the king and he told king arthur and his court all that had befallen hiding nothing from them now queen guinevere was very much displeased when she heard how sir gawain saw no mercy to that knight and how he had struck the lady with his sword wherefore she said aside to one of those who stood nigh to her it seems to me a very strange thing for a belted knight to do to refuse to give mercy unto a fallen enemy and to strike a lady with his sword for i should think that any sword that had drawn blood from a lady in such wise would be dishonoured for i and i cannot think that any one who would strike a lady in that wise would hold himself guiltless unto his vow of knighthood this sir gawain overheard and he was exceedingly wroth thereat but he concealed his anger at the time only after he had gone away he said to gaheris his brother i believe that the lady hateth me with all her heart but some time i will show to her that i have in me more courtesy and i am more gentle than she believes me to be as for my sword since she deemeth to be dishonoured by that blow i will not use it any more so he took the sword out of its sheath and brake it across his knee and flung it away now all this hath been told to set forth that which follows for there ye shall learn what great things of nobility sir gawain could do when it behooved him to do them for haply ye who have read this story may feel as queen guinevere did that sir gawain was not rightwise courteous as a belted knight should have been in that adventure aforetold End of section thirty eight Recording by Daphne Ma Section 39 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Perkins The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle Chapter 2nd how King Arthur became lost in the forest, and how he fell into a very singular adventure in a castle unto which he came. Now it befell upon a time some while after this, that King Arthur was at Tintagalon upon certain affairs of state, and Queen Guinevere and her court and the king's court made progression from Camelot unto Carleon, and there they abided until the king should be through his business at Tintagalon, and should join them at Carleon now that time was the spring of the year and all things were very jolly and gay wherefore king arthur became possessed with a great desire for adventure so he called unto him a certain favourite esquire hight boisengard and he said to him boisengard this day is so pleasant that i hardly know how i may contain myself because of the joy i take in it for it seems to be that my heart is nigh ready to burst with a great pleasure of desiring so i am of a mind to go a gadding with only thee for companion to this boisengard said lord i know of nothing that would give to me a greater pleasure than that so king arthur said very well let us then go away from this place in such a manner that no one will be aware of our departure and so we will go to carleon and surprise the queen by coming unexpectedly to that place so boisengard brought armour without device and he clad the king in that armour and then they two rode forth together and no one wist that they had left the castle and when they came forth into the fields, King Arthur whistled and sang and jested and laughed and made himself merry. 
for he was as a war horse turned forth upon the grass that taketh glory in the sunshine and the warm air and becometh like unto a colt again so by and by they came into the forest and rode that way with great content of spirit and they took this path and they took that path for no reason but because the day was so gay and jolly so by and by they lost their way in the mazes of the woodland and knew not where they were now when they found themselves to be lost in that wise they journeyed with more circumspection going first by this way and then by that but in no manner could they find their way out from their entanglement and so fell night time and they knew not where they were but all became very dark and obscure with the woodland full of strange and unusual sounds around about them then king arthur said boisenard this is a very perplexing pass and i do not know how we shall find lodging for this night to this boisenard said lord if i have thy permission to do so i will climb one of these trees and see if i can discover any sign of habitation in this wilderness and king arthur said do so i pray thee so boisenard climbed a very tall tree and from the top of the tree he beheld a light a great distance away and he said lord i see a light in that direction and therewith he came down from the tree again so king arthur and boisenard went in the direction that boisenard had beheld the light and by and by they came out of the forest and into an open place where they beheld a very great castle with several tall towers very grim and forbidding of appearance and it was from this castle that the light had appeared that boisenard had seen so they too rode up to the castle and boisenard called aloud and smote upon the gate of the castle then immediately there came a porter and demanded of them what they would have unto him boisenard said sirrah we would come into lodge for to-night for we are aweary so the porter said who are you speaking very roughly and rudely to them for he could not see of what condition they were because of the darkness then boisenard said this is a knight of very good quality and i am his esquire and we have lost our way in the forest and now we come hither seeking shelter sir said the porter if ye know what is good for you ye will sleep in the forest rather than come into this place for this is no very good retreat for errant knights to shelter themselves upon this king arthur bespake the porter for that which the porter said aroused great curiosity within him so he said nay we will not go away from here and we demand to lodge here for this night then the porter said very well ye may come in and thereupon he opened the gate and they rode into the courtyard of that castle now at the noise of their coming there appeared a great many lights within the castle and there came running forth diverse attendants some of these aided king arthur and boisenard to dismount and others took the horses and others again brought basins of water for them to wash withal and after they had washed their faces and hands other attendants brought them into the castle now as they came into the castle they were aware of a great noise of very many people talking and laughing together with the sound of singing and of harping and so they came into the hall of the castle and beheld that it was lighted with a great number of candles and tapers and torches here they found a multitude of people gathered at a table spread for a feast and at the head of the table there sat a knight well advanced in years and with hair and beard white as milk yet he was exceedingly strong and sturdy of frame having shoulders of wonderful broadness and a great girth of chest this knight was of a very stern and forbidding appearance and was clad altogether in black and he wore around his neck a chain of gold with a locket of gold hanging pendant from it now when this knight beheld king arthur and boisenard come into the hall he called aloud to them in a very great voice bidding them to come and sit with him at the head of the table and they did so and those at the head of the table made place for them and thus they sat there beside the knight now king arthur and boisenard were exceedingly hungry wherefore they ate with great appetite and made joy of the entertainment which they received and meantime the knight held them in very pleasant discourse talking to them of such things as would give them the most entertainment 
So after a while, the feast was ended, and they ceased from eating. Then of a sudden, the knight said to King Arthur, Messiah, thou art young and lusty of spirit, and I doubt not but thou hath a great heart within thee. What say you now to a little sport betwixt us two? Upon this, King Arthur regarded that knight very steadily, and he believed that his face was not so old as it looked, for his eyes were exceedingly bright and shone like sparks of light. Wherefore, he was a doubt, and he said, Sir, what sport would you have? Upon this, the knight fell a laughing in great measure, and he said, This is a very strange sport that I have in mind, for it is this that thou and I shall prove the one unto the other what courage each of us may have. And King Arthur said, How shall we prove that? Whereunto the knight made reply, This is what we shall do. Thou and I shall stand forth in the middle of this hall, and thou shalt have leave to try to strike off my head. And if I can receive that blow without dying therefrom, then I shall have leave to strike thy head off in a like manner. Upon this speech, King Arthur was greatly adread, and he said, That is very strange sport for two men to engage upon. Now when King Arthur said this, all those who were in the hall burst out laughing beyond all measure, and as though they would never stint from their mirth. Then, when they had become in a measure quiet again, the knight of that castle said, Sir, art thou afraid of that sport? Upon which King Arthur fell very angry, and he said, Nay, I am not afeard, for no man hath ever yet had reason to say that I showed myself afeard of any one. Very well, said the knight of the castle, then let us try that sport of which I spake. And King Arthur said, I am willing. Then Boisengard came to King Arthur where he was, and he said, Lord, do not thou enter into this thing, but rather let me undertake this venture in thy stead, for I am assured that some great treachery is meditated against thee. But King Arthur said, Nay, no man shall take my danger upon himself, but I will assume mine own danger without calling upon any man to take it. So he said to the knight of the castle, Sir, I am ready for that sport of which thou didst speak, but who is to strike that first blow, and how shall we draw lots therefore? Messiah, said the knight of the castle, there shall be no lots drawn, for as thou art the guest of this place, so shall thou have first assay at that sport. Therewith that knight arose and laid aside his black robe, and he was clad beneath in a shirt of fine linen, very cunningly worked, and he wore hosen of crimson. Then he opened that linen undergarment at the throat, and he turned down the collar thereof so as to lay his neck bare to the blow. Thereupon he said, Now, sir knight, thou shalt have to strike well if thou wouldst win at this sport. But King Arthur showed no dread of that undertaking, for he arose and drew Excalibur so that the blade of the sword flashed with exceeding brightness. Then he measured his distance and lifted the sword, and he smote the knight of the castle with all his might upon the neck. And lo, the blade cut through the neck of the knight of the castle with wonderful ease, so that the head flew from the body to a great distance away. But the trunk of the body of that knight did not fall, but instead of that it stood and it walked to where the head lay, and the hands of the trunk picked up the head, and they set the head back upon the body, and lo, that knight was as sound and whole as ever he had been in all his life. Upon this all those of the castle shouted and made great mirth, and they called upon King Arthur that it was now his turn to try that sport. So the king prepared himself, laying aside his surcoat and opening his undergarment at the throat, as the knight of the castle had done, and at that Boisengard made great lamentation. Then the knight of the castle said, Sir, art thou afeard? And King Arthur said, No, I am not afeard, for every man must come to his death some time, and it appears that my time hath now come, and that I am to lay down my life in this foolish fashion for no fault of mine own. Then the knight of the castle said, 
Well, stand thou away a little distance, so that I may not strike thee too close, and so lose the virtue of my blow. So King Arthur stood forth in the midst of the hall, and the knight of the castle swung his sword several times, but did not strike. Likewise, he several times laid the blade of the sword upon King Arthur's neck, and it was very cold. Then King Arthur cried out in great passion, Sir, it is thy right to strike, but I beseech thee not to torment me in this manner. Nay, said the knight of the castle, it is my right to strike when it pleases me, and I will not strike any before that time. For if it please me, I will torment thee for a great while ere I slay thee. So he laid his sword several times more upon King Arthur's neck, and King Arthur said no more, but bore that torment with a very steadfast spirit. Then the knight of the castle said, Thou appearest to be a very courageous and honorable knight, and I have a mind to make a covenant with thee. And King Arthur said, What is that covenant? It is this, said the knight of the castle, I will spare thee thy life for a year and a day if thou wilt pledge me thy knightly word to return hither at the end of that time. Then King Arthur said, Very well, it shall be so. And therewith he pledged his knightly word to return at the end of that time, swearing to that pledge upon the cross of the hilt of Excalibur. Then the knight of the castle said, I will make another covenant with thee. What is it? said King Arthur. My second covenant is this, quoth the knight of the castle. I will give to thee a riddle, and if thou wilt answer that riddle when thou returnest hither, and if thou makest no mistake in that answer, then will I spare thy life and set thee free. And King Arthur said, What is that riddle? To which the knight made reply, The riddle is this. What is it that a woman desires most of all in the world? Sir, said King Arthur, I will seek to find the answer to that riddle, and I give thee gramercy for sparing my life for so long a time as thou hast done, and for giving me the chance to escape my death. Upon this, the knight of the castle smiled very sourly, and he said, I do not offer this to thee because of mercy to thee, but because I find pleasure in tormenting thee. For what delight canst thou have in living thy life when thou knowest that thou must, for a surety, die at the end of one short year? And what pleasure canst thou have in living even that year when thou shalt be tormented with anxiety to discover the answer to my riddle? Then King Arthur said, I think thou art very cruel. And the knight said, I am not denying that. So that night King Arthur and Boisingard lay at the castle, and the next day they took their way thence. And King Arthur was very heavy and troubled in spirit. Nay the less, he charged Boisingard that he should say nothing concerning that which had befallen, but that he should keep it in secret. And Boisingard did as the king commanded, and said nothing concerning that adventure. Now in that year which followed, King Arthur settled his affairs. Also he sought everywhere to find the answer to that riddle. Many there were who gave him answers in plenty, for one said that a woman most desired wealth, and another said she most desired beauty, and one said she desired power to please, and another said that she most desired fine raiment, and one said this, and another said that but no answer appeared to King Arthur to be good and fitting for his purpose. So the year passed by until only a fortnight remained, and then King Arthur could not abide to stay where he was any longer, for it seemed to him his time was very near to hand, and he was filled with a very bitter anxiety of soul, wherefore he was very restless to be away. So he called Boisingard to him, and he said, Boisingard! Help me to arm, for I am going away. Then Boisingard fell a weeping in very great measure, and he said, Lord, do not go. At this King Arthur looked very sternly at his esquire and said, Boisingard, how is this? Wouldst thou tempt me to violate mine honor? It is not very hard to die, but it would be very bitter to live my life in dishonor. Wherefore tempt me no more, but do my bidding, and hold thy peace. And if I do not return in a month from this time, then mayest thou tell all that hath befallen. 
and thou mayest tell sir constantine of cornwall that he is to search the papers in my cabinet and that there he will find all that is to be done should death overtake me so boisenard put a plain suit of armor upon king arthur though he could hardly see what he was about for the tears that flowed down out of his eyes in great abundance and he laced upon the armor of the king a surcoat without device and he gave the king a shield without device thereupon king arthur rode away without considering whither his way took him and of every one whom he met he inquired what that thing was that a woman most desired and no one could give him an answer that appeared to him to be what it should be wherefore he was in great doubt and torment of spirit now the day before king arthur was to keep his covenant at that castle he was wandering through the adjacent forest in great travail of soul, for he wist not what he should do to save his life. As he wandered so, he came of a sudden upon a small hut built up under an overhanging oak tree, so that it was very hard to tell where the oak tree ended and the hut began. And there were a great many large rocks all about covered with moss, so that the king might very easily have passed by the hut, only that he beheld a smoke to arise therefrom, as from a fire that burned within. So he went to the hut, and opened the door, and entered. At first he thought there was no one there, but when he looked again he beheld an old woman sitting bent over a small fire that burned upon the hearth and king arthur had never beheld such an ugly beldame as that one who sat there bending over that fire for her ears were very huge and flapped and her hair hung down over her head like two snakes and her face was covered all over with wrinkles so that there were not any places at all where there was not a wrinkle and her eyes were bleared and covered over with a film and the eyelids were red as with the continual weeping of her eyes and she had but one tooth in her mouth and her hands which she spread out to the fire were like claws of bone then king arthur gave her greeting and she gave the king greeting and she said to him my lord king whence come ye and why do you come to this place then king arthur was greatly astonished that the old woman should know him who he was and he said who are you that appeareth to know me no matter said she i am one who meaneth you well so tell me what is the trouble that brings you here at this time so the king confessed all his trouble to that old woman and he asked her if she knew the answer to that riddle what is it that a woman most desires yea said the old woman i know the answer to that riddle very well but i will not tell it to thee unless thou wilt promise me something in return at this king arthur was filled with very great joy that the old woman should know the answer of that riddle and he was filled with doubt of what she would demand of him wherefore he said what is it thou must have in return for that answer then the old woman said if i aid thee to guess thy riddle aright thou must promise that i shall become wife unto one of the knights of thy court whom i may choose when thou returnest homeward again ha said king arthur how may i promise that upon the behalf of any one upon this the old woman said are not the knights of thy court of such nobility that they will do that to save thee from death i believe they are said king arthur and with that he meditated a long while saying unto himself what will my kingdom do if i die at this time i have no right to die so he said to the old woman very well i will make that promise then she said unto the king this is the answer to that riddle that which a woman most desires is to have her will and the answer seemed to king arthur to be altogether right then the old woman said my lord king thou hast been played upon by that knight who hath led thee into this trouble for he is a great conjurer and a magician of a very evil sort he carrieth his life not within his body but in a crystal globe which he weareth in a locket hanging about his neck wherefore it was that when thou didst cut the head from off his body his life remained in that locket and he did not die but if thou hadst destroyed that locket then he would immediately have died i will mind me of that said king arthur 
So King Arthur abided with that old woman for that night, and she refreshed him with meat and drink and served him very well. And the next morning he set forth unto that castle where he had made his covenant, and his heart was more cheerful than it had been for a whole year. End of section 39. Recording by Adam Perkins. Section 40 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Perkins. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. Part 3 The Story of Sir Gawain, Chapter 3rd and Conclusion. How King Arthur overcame the knight enchanter, and how Sir Gawain manifested the high nobility of his knighthood. Now, when King Arthur came to the castle, the gateway thereof was immediately opened to him, and he entered. And when he had entered, sundry attendants came and conducted him into the hall where he had aforetime been. There he beheld the knight of that castle, and a great many people who had come to witness the conclusion of the adventure. And when the knight beheld King Arthur, he said to him, Sir, hast thou come to redeem thy pledge? Yea, said King Arthur, for so I made my vow to thee. Then the knight of the castle said, Sir, hast thou guessed that riddle? And King Arthur said, I believe that I have. The knight of the castle said, then let me hear thy answer thereto. But if thou makest any mistake, or if thou dost not guess aright, then is thy life forfeit. Very well, said King Arthur, let it be that way. Now this is the answer to thy riddle. That which a woman most desires is to have her will. Now when the lord of the castle heard King Arthur guess aright, he wist not what to say or where to look, and those who were there also perceived that the king had guessed aright. Then King Arthur came very close to that knight with great sternness of demeanor, and he said, Now, thou traitor knight, thou didst ask me to enter into thy sport with thee a year ago, so at these present it is my turn to ask thee to have sport with me, and this is the sport I will have, that thou shalt give me that chain and locket that hang about thy neck, and that I shall give thee the collar which hangeth about my neck. At this the face of that knight fell all pale, like to ashes, and he emitted a sound similar to the sound made by a hare when the hound lays hold upon it. Then King Arthur catched him very violently by the arm, and he catched the locket, and brake it away from about the knight's neck. And upon that the knight shrieked very loud, and fell down upon his knees, and besought mercy of the king, and there was great uproar in that place. Then King Arthur opened the locket, and lo, there was a ball as of crystal, very clear and shining. And King Arthur said, I will have no mercy. And therewith he flung the ball violently down upon the stone of the pavement, so that it brake with a loud noise. Then, upon that instant, the knight conjurer gave a piercing, bitter cry, and fell down upon the ground. And when they ran to raise him up, behold, he was entirely dead. Now when the people of that castle beheld their knight thus suddenly dead, and when they beheld King Arthur how he stood in the fury of his kingly majesty, they were greatly afeared, so that they shrunk away from the king where he stood. Then the king turned and went out from that castle, and no one stayed him, and he mounted his horse and rode away, and no one gave him let or hindrance in his going. Now when the king had left the castle in that wise, he went straight to the hut where was the old beldame, and he said to her, Thou hast holpen me a very great deal in mine hour of need, so now will I fulfill that pledge which I made unto thee, for I will take thee unto my court, and thou shalt choose one of my knights for thy husband, for I think there is not one knight in all my court, but would be very glad to do anything that lieth in his power to reward one who hath saved me, as thou hast done this day." Therewith he took that old woman, and he lifted her up upon the crupper of his horse, then he himself mounted upon his horse, and so they rode away from that place. 
and the king comported himself to that aged beldame in all ways with the utmost consideration as though she had been a beautiful dame of the highest degree in the land likewise he showed her such respect that had she been a lady of royal blood he could not have shown greater respect to her so in due time they reached the court which was then at carleon and they came there nigh about midday now about that time it chanced that the queen and a number of the lords of the court and a number of the ladies of the court were out in the fields enjoying the pleasantness of maytime for no one in all the world excepting the esquire boisengard knew anything of the danger that beset king arthur hence all were very glad of the pleasantness of the season now as king arthur drew nigh to that place these lifted up their eyes and beheld him come and they were astonished beyond all measure to see king arthur come to them across that field with that old beldame behind him upon the saddle wherefore they stood still to wait until king arthur reached them but when king arthur had come to them he did not dismount from his horse but sat thereon and regarded them all very steadfastly and queen guinevere said sir what is this hast thou a mind to play some merry jest this day that thou hast brought hither that old woman lady said king arthur excepting for this old woman it were like to have been a very sorry jest for thee and for me for had she not aided me i would now have been a dead man and in a few days you would doubtless all have been in great passion of sorrow then all they who were there marvelled very greatly at the king's words and the queen said sir what is it that hath befallen thee thereupon king arthur told them all that had happened to him from the very beginning when he and boisengard had left the castle of tintagalon and when he had ended his story they were greatly amazed now there were seventeen lords of the court there present so when king arthur had ended his story he said unto these messires i have given my pledge unto this aged woman that any one of you whom she may choose shall take her unto him as his wife and shall treat her with all the regard that it is possible for him to do for this was the condition that she laid upon me now tell me did i do right in making unto her my pledge that i would fulfil that which she desired and all of those who were present said yea lord thou didst right for we would do all in the world for to save thee from such peril as that from which thou hast escaped then king arthur said to that old woman lady is there any of these knights here whom you would choose for to be your husband upon this the old woman pointed with her very long bony finger unto sir gawain saying yea i would marry that lord for i see by the chain that is around his neck and by the golden circlet upon his hair and by the haughty nobility of his aspect that he must be the son of a king then king arthur said unto sir gawain sir art thou willing to fulfil my pledge unto this old woman and sir gawain said yea lord whatsoever thou requirest of me that will i do so sir gawain came to the old woman and took her into his hands and set it to his lips and not one of all those present so much as smiled then they all turned their faces and returned unto the king's castle and they were very silent and downcast for this was sore trouble that had come upon that court now after they had returned unto the court they assigned certain apartments therein to that old woman and they clad her in rich raiment such as a queen might wear and they assigned unto her a court such as was fit for a queen and it seemed to all the court that in the rich robes which she wore she was ten times more ugly than she was before so when eleven days had passed sir gawain was wedded to that old woman in the chapel of the king's court with great ceremony and pomp of circumstance and all of those who were there were as sad and as sorrowful as though sir gawain had been called upon to suffer his death afterward that they were married sir gawain and the old woman went to sir gawain's house and there sir gawain shut himself off from all the world and suffered no one to come nigh him for he was proud beyond all measure and in this great humiliation he suffered in such a wise that words cannot tell how great was that humiliation 
wherefore he shut himself away from the world that no one might behold his grief and his shame and all the rest of that day he walked continually up and down his chamber for he was altogether in such despair that it came unto his mind that it would be well if he took his own life for it seemed to him impossible for to suffer such shame as that which had come upon him so after a while it fell the dark of the early night and therewith a certain strength came to sir gawaine and he said this is a shame for me for to behave in this way for since i have married that lady she is my true wedded wife and i do not treat her with that regard unto which she hath the right so he went out of that place and sought the apartment of that old woman who was his wife and by that time it was altogether dark but when sir gawaine had come into that place where she was the old woman upbraided him crying out upon him so sir you have treated me but ill upon this our wedding day for you have stayed all the afternoon away from me and now only come to me when it is dark night and sir gawaine said lady i could not help it for i was very sore oppressed with many cares but if i have disregarded thee this day i do beseech thy forgiveness therefore and i will hold myself willing to do all that is in my power to recompense thee for any neglect that i have placed upon thee then the lady said sir it is very dark in this place let us then have a light it shall be as thou dost desire said sir gawain and i myself will go and fetch a light for thee so sir gawain went forth from that place and he brought two waxen tapers one in either hand and he bore them in candlesticks of gold for he was minded to show all respect unto that old woman and when he came into the room he perceived that she was at the farther end of the apartment and he went toward her and she arose and stood before him as he approached but when the circle of light fell upon that old woman, and when Sir Gawain beheld her who stood before him, he cried out aloud in a very great voice because of the great marvel and wonder of that which he saw. For instead of that old woman whom he had left, he beheld a lady of extraordinary beauty, and in the very flower of her youth and he beheld that her hair was long and glossy and very black and that her eyes were likewise black like to black jewels and that her lips were like coral and her teeth were like pearls so for a while sir gawain could not speak and then he cried out lady lady who art thou then that lady smiled upon sir gawain with such loving kindness that he wist not what to think other than that this was an angel who had descended to that place out of paradise wherefore he stood before her for a long time and could find no more words to say and she continued to smile upon him very kindly in that wise then by and by sir gawain said to her lady where is that dame who is my wife and the lady said sir gawain i am she it is not possible cried out sir gawain for she was old and extraordinarily ugly but i believe that thou art beautiful beyond any lady whom i have beheld and the lady said nevertheless i am she and because thou hast taken me for thy wife with thine own free will and with great courtesy so is a part of that enchantment that lay upon me removed from me for i will now be able to appear before thee in mine own true shape for whiles i was a little while ago so ugly and foul as thou didst behold me to be now am i to be as thou seest me for one half the day and the other half thereof i must be ugly as i was before then sir gawain was filled beyond all words with great joy and with that joy there came an extreme passion of loving regard for that lady so he cried out aloud several times this is surely the most wonderful thing that ever befell any man in all the world therewith he fell down upon his knees and took that lady's hands into his own hands and kissed her hands with great fervour and all the while she smiled upon him as she had done at first then again the lady said come 
sit thee down beside me and let us consider what part of the day i shall be in the one guise and what part of the day i shall be in the other guise for all day i may have the one appearance and all night i may have the other appearance then sir gawaine said i would have thee in this guise during the night time for then we are together at our own inn and since thou art of this sort that i now see thee i do not at all reckon how the world may regard thee upon this the lady spake with great animation saying no sir i would not have it in that wise for every woman loveth the regard of the world and i would fain enjoy such beauty as is mine before the world and not endure the scorn and contempt of men and women to this sir gawaine said lady i would have it the other way and she said nay i would have it my way then sir gawaine said so be it for since i have taken thee for my wife so must i show thee respect in all matters wherefore thou shalt have thy will in this and in all other things then that lady fell a laughing beyond all measure and she said sir i did but put this as a last trial upon thee for as i am now so shall i always be upon this sir gawaine was so filled with joy that he knew not how to contain himself so they sat together for a long time hand in hand then after a while sir gawaine said lady who art thou unto which she made reply i am one of the ladies of the lake but for thy sake i have become mortal like to other women and have quit that very beautiful home where i one time dwelt i have kept thee in my heart for a considerable while for i was not very far distant at that time when thou didst bid adieu to sir pelias beside the lake there i beheld how thou didst weep and bewail thyself when sir pelias left thee wherefore my heart went out to thee with great pity so after a while i quitted that lake and became mortal for thy sake now when i found the trouble into which king arthur had fallen i took that occasion to have him fetch me unto thee so that i might test the entire nobility of thy knighthood and lo i have found it all that i deemed it possible to be for though i appeared to thee so aged so ugly and so foul yet hast thou treated me with such kind regard that i do not believe that thou couldst have behaved with more courtesy to me had i been the daughter of a king wherefore it doth now afford me such pleasure for to possess thee for my knight and my true lord that i cannot very well tell thee how great is my joy therein then sir gawaine said lady i do not think it can be so great as my joy in possessing thee and thereupon he came to her and laid his hand upon her shoulder and kissed her upon the lips then after that he went forth and called with a great voice all through that house and the people of the house came running from everywhere and he commanded that the people should bring lights and refreshments and they brought the lights and when they had brought them and beheld that beautiful lady instead of the aged dame they were filled with great wonder and joy wherefore they cried out loud and clapped their hands together and made much sound of rejoicing and they set a great feast for sir gawaine and his lady and in place of the sorrow and darkness that had been there was joy and light and music and dancing wherefore those of the king's court beholding this from a distance said it is very strange that sir gawaine should have taken so much joy of having wedded that old beldame but when the next morning had come that lady clad herself in raiment of yellow silk and she hung about her many strands of precious stones of several colours and she set a golden crown upon her head and sir gawaine let call his horse and he let call a snow-white palfrey for the lady and thereupon they rode out from that place and entered the court of the king but when the king and the queen and their several courts beheld that lady they were filled with such great astonishment that they wist not what to say for pure wonder and when they heard all that had happened they gave great joy and loud acclaim so that all their mourning was changed into rejoicing and indeed there was not one knight there of all that court who would not have given half his life to have been so fortunate in that matter as was sir gawaine the son of king lot of orkney such is the story of sir gawaine and from it i draw this significance 
as that poor ugly beldame appeared unto the eyes of sir gawaine so doth a man's duty sometimes appear to him to be ugly and exceedingly ill-favoured unto his desires but when he shall have wedded himself unto that duty so that he hath made it one with him as a bridegroom maketh himself one with his bride then doth that duty become of a sudden very beautiful unto him and unto others so may it be with ye that you shall take duty unto yourselves no matter how much it may mislike ye to do so for indeed a man shall hardly have any real pleasure in his life unless his inclination becometh wedded unto his duty and cleaveth unto it as a husband cleaveth unto his wife for when inclination is thus wedded unto duty then doth the soul take great joy unto itself as though a wedding had taken place betwixt a bridegroom and a bride within its tabernacle likewise when you shall have become entirely wedded unto your duty then shall you become equally worthy with that good knight and gentleman sir gawaine for it needs not that a man shall wear armor for to be a true knight but only that he shall do his best endeavor with all patience and humility as it hath been ordained for him to do wherefore when your time cometh unto you to display your knightness by assuming your duty i do pray that you also may approve yourself as worthy as sir gawaine approved himself in this story which i have told you of as above written conclusion so endeth this volume wherein hath been told with every circumstance of narration the history of those three worthies who were of the court of king arthur and now if god will give me the grace to do so i will some time at no very great time from this write the further history of sundry other knights and worthies of whom i have not yet spoken and among the first of these shall be sir lancelot whom all the world knoweth to have been the greatest knight in prowess of arms of any who has lived excepting sir galahad who was his son and i shall tell you the story of sir ewine and sir geraint and of sir percival and of sundry others but of this another time for now with great regret i bid you adieu and bring this history unto a close so may god grant us to come together at another time with such happiness and prosperity that you may have a free and untroubled heart to enjoy the narrated history of those excellent men which i shall then set before you amen end of section 40 recording by adam perkins eagle mountain utah end of the story of king arthur and his knights by howard pyle